Hola, buena Anita, Tutón, buena tarde, buenas tardes. Hola, eh, good muchas... evening. Uh, thank you very much for being here. This third lecture of the series Photography and Chance, organized by the Fundación Matri and the Panoramic Festival. We have Joachim uh, Schmidt. For coming. Y Andrés Hispano estará moderando, presentando. And Andrés Hispano will present and chair the session. I'll pass the floor to you. And uh, those of you who are following online, please remember that at the bottom of the screen, you can select to listen to the interpreting into Spanish. All right. Thank you very much. And you can also leave your questions and answers in the chat and they'll be passed on to uh, the speakers. Thank you. Hello, good evening. I want to thank, first of all, the opportunity of sharing this session with uh, Joachim uh, Schmidt. And of course, at Panoramic, we are happy to be here at this meeting, this session. Um, about 150 years ago, for the first time in the setting of what is called the mass culture, people were surrounded by pictures in the form of postcards, newspapers with pictures, uh, signs, posters, wrapping paper, calling cards. And this led to the first strategies and rights to control that overproduction of images what seemed to be a huge amount of images in the streets of Paris, Vienna, many towns filled up, and it would seem impossible today because of all the regulations that we have, filled up with uh, posters, advertising, surprising amount of images. And that led, for instance, to many homes. In many homes, people began to have to keep scrapbooks as a model to manage or a way to manage that amount of pictures and images. Uh, things like the first albums that people had in scrapbooks and people used collage. And that was something that was used in the avant-garde movements to control and manage those images. One of the books that Mark Twain uh, uh, And one of his first books was uh, the scrapbook, a uh, blank book for people to put in images. And there were many similar things in Spain. We had the, there was a scrapbook that was used for cuttings that were put on the table and they made a collage. And if they liked the pictures and the way that they were laid out on the table, they were stuck on, uh, backgrounds and framed, and we have them in museums. Juan Bordes says that when the avant-garde movements recovered the format of the collage, collage, they did so to recover a format that was had previously been used by children and their parents on a Saturday morning. And in different at different times, when images uh, were produced in the 60s, in the 80s, and now with the internet, we have seen how these strategies have increased, these games have increased to attempt to manage and control that huge production of images through appropriation, collage, different formats, moving pictures, and also still pictures. And it's significant in the 70s, 1970s, Mike Mandel evidence, his work, where they showed us that uh, it's not only interesting to become a hunter of images, but also to learn to discover the way of giving value to those images, to give them significance. They presented uh, an exhibition of images produced with no artistic uh, idea, uh, police images, medical images, forensic images, and they presented them in such a way that people understood that there was an aesthetic or professional interest in those images, and that it depended on the judgment of the ob observer. The artist there was a medium, and it was important to, to select the images and present them. But this changed the way people looked at photographs, and it also empowered the spectator 
who could reconsider what makes an image interesting. And uh, in the 1980s, beginning of the 80s, when almost, well, there was, when photography was trying to enter into the market, the art market, um, it was when Joachim Schmidt and other artists began to, to develop their careers as professionals, photographers, essayists, and there was a new way of understanding common photography, ordinary photography, and there was a struggle by many artists to get into the art market with a capital A of artist. And uh, there was, and that led to the beginning of a whole movement and people wanted to become uh, and to reproduce the uh, legacy of the art of the past. I remember seeing an exhibition of Bruce Weller in London where the pictures were framed like, like paintings. And uh, it was a bit petulant, a bit sort of arrogant. It was an attempt to get photography to be recognized as some kind of a classic form of painting. And it was typical. And many people, many collectors of uh, pictures and orphan cinema uh, showed the people that there was an extraordinary amount of images uh, that began to appear on the market that uh, that had to do with family albums and every day, the everyday life of people, what grandparents had done and uh, in the same way that uh, they'd left behind houses and furniture and things, they'd also left behind a huge amount of pictures and those pictures had some kind of meaning. And that was the beginning, uh, the beginning of the 80s of uh, Joachim Schmidt's career. He studied uh, visual culture in Berlin. And after a few years, he tried photography in the traditional manner with a camera looking for things to photograph. He created Film Critique, the magazine 82 to 87, where he showed profusely or rebelled against this petulance of uh, photography that wanted to be serious art and painting. We can remember John Salde, uh, Peter Witkin, very interesting work, but uh, their association with other disciplines is obvious. And he defended and advocated when he was an essayist in this magazine, he spoke about the interest of the production that had not been considered serious until that moment. Pierre Corvier, Pete Turner, uh, some of these photographers that were looking for uh, sleek aesthetics that are considered uh, obsolete today. Uh, it was really the first person that included appreciations on domestic photography and considered some of the features, mistakes, errors to be very interesting in domestic pho uh, photography. And as an essayist during that time, Schmidt focused on uh, on this production of domestic family photography that did not have any artistic uh, um, or did not try to be art in any in any way, had not try had not been produced as art. He doesn't like to talk about strategies or games, but chance played a very important role. And suddenly the opportunity came along to establish and to reconsider and to go back and present again those collections and, and that work as an artistic work. And uh, that led to dozens, hundreds of works, possibilities, on uh, uh, associated with this material. A lot of it uh, went into books, books where Schmidt edited himself, published himself, but then he began to work uh, on ABC book operative print on demand system or that produce uh, books on demand. And he doesn't remember perhaps, uh, but there are about 200 books 
by Schmidt. And I think he will talk about some of them and show us some of them, and we'll see the wide ranging scope of his proposals based on all this material over time. In 2011, together with Clement Chéroux and others, Eric Kessers and Martin Barr, they signed the From Here On Manifesto, which um, was or attempted to point out the new scenario that we had thanks to the new cameras, the new ways of sharing pictures, and uh, the acquisition of what they'd said in the 70s, uh, Sultan Mandel had spoken about. The most important thing in photography is not the technical production of uh, photographs or the archiving of images, but uh, it lies in the possibility, the democratic pos possibility of giving new meaning to pictures all the time, comments, uh, things like that. Um, when images are distributed, new meanings are given to them all the time. And this is one of the most interesting things that they've helped us to see these artists in the last decades, to reconsider photography in ways that are completely novel and artists, uh, photographs by great artists or by people that were completely anonymous and didn't have any technical training. Everybody produces images that we all benefit from, especially when we rename them and reconsider them and give them new meaning. And you have an extraordinary documentary, at least to see the process of searching for images of Joachim in markets, which is called Discarded, produced by the Carnegie Museum of Art. And uh, there's also a, an interview there, an in-depth interview, and that shows his process of creation. And I think we'll be able to talk later about not just his career, but the time or the period or what he's doing right now. He's changed his life in the city for a life uh, outside of the city. And I think he's looking at new ways of working because part of the process of collecting images is not the same as it used to be. And I think in a certain way, like other great collectors, uh, Rick Perringer, um, who in terms of motion pictures has collected more, uh, a greater amount of orphan films. He collected a huge amount and then um, gave them to the Library of Congress. He uh, unloaded himself of that. And he said, curiously, after having collected thousands of picture of uh, films, he said, art must learn from cooking. You keep the recipe, but you throw away the leftovers. Uh, um, 10 Westerns would be enough for us to continue to, uh, to produce extraordinary Westerns for the rest of history. We don't have to get obsessed with this. And that's part of the Derrida's uh, archive fever. Everybody who's in the collecting world, in the world of archiving, knows that to preserve something means to destroy 10, 20, 100 other things. And the people that are closer to collections and archives are the witnesses of these processes of uh, destruction. And to go to a street market, we'll see in the documentary of Schmidt, you see how he carefully selects one picture out of 500 out of 1,000. He's been described as a professional looker. He remembers at least once having looked at 10,000 pictures in one day. Good. So without any further ado, I'll pass the floor to him, to Joe Kim. I think he will tell us part of all this in his presentation, and then we'll have some questions and Q&A. Thank you. Joe Kim. Uh, thank you very much, Andres, for the introduction. I'm not sure you actually need a second talk after this one, uh, but probably I won't be paid if I don't deliver, so I better do that. Uh, thanks, Juan and Maria, for bringing me here and for inviting me. Uh, I want to talk about the a bit about the history and the role of chance in photography. And when talking about photography, uh, I usually talk about photography as a cultural practice, not about art photography. If I talk about art photography, I mention that specifically. So that's probably um, important to keep in mind. And then I will present a number of uh, artworks that I 
think were quite uh, crucial for my own understanding of how I look at photography and how I practice photography before uh, turning to my own work and uh, presenting a number of works and telling you how they operate in respect to chance, random, serendipity, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's not exactly the same, but it, uh, it's employed in different ways. So in the early days of photography, substantial knowledge and skill were needed to create a photograph, technical skill that is, regardless of any aesthetic aspect of the picture. A look at the most basic decisions a photographer has to make illustrates that chances to get it right were close to nil for an uneducated person. When the technique got more popular, and equipment and materials were produced industrially, the required skill became a problem. People liked making photographs, but as many of them had only little knowledge, the results were often poor. In response to this problem, the industry started incorporating knowledge into the camera. Gradually, it became an automatic idiot-proof device. Making mistakes became less likely, while at the same time, photographs became more predictable, more standardized. Eliminating chance turned out to be the recipe for commercial success. With a device that is saturated with knowledge, even a monkey is able to take a photograph. And with a bit of good luck, even a good photograph, as we have seen. And this is actually unique. It does not happen in writing or in music or in any other artistic discipline. An experiment conducted at Plymouth University in 2003 provides ample evidence. A group of researchers placed a word processor in the monkey enclosure of a zoological garden for one month and gave the animals access to the keyboard. After initially attempting to destroy the keyboard, then urinating on it, the monkeys did eventually produce some five pages of writing, mostly repetitions of the letter S, but not one single word in any language known. Writing requires a basic understanding of syntax. It's similar in music. Give the monkeys a grand piano and you, and you will get no results that resemble any music made by humans. But give the monkeys a very different. That's because a modern camera is saturated with knowledge, whereas a typewriter or a piano are not. The devices we use today are the preliminary end of this process. Every modern smartphone is equipped with a highly sophisticated camera, controlled by complex algorithms that make it virtually impossible to produce a photograph that does not match established patterns of desire. It's the perfect device for users whose skill and knowledge about the magic black box does not exceed the monkeys by much. It's the triumph of the engineer over the artisan. For decades, engineers were busy eliminating chance. Now they are nearly there. The more knowledge was incorporated into cameras, the more standardized became the output. But repetitive patterns are not only the result of advanced, advanced camera technology, but of standardized behavior in modern society. Let's have a look at a popular example. Traditionally, people make many photographs while traveling. Traveling itself became an industry with its own standards. Countless tourists produce countless photographs. And as both the travel routine and the image technology are standardized, we might assume that their photographs look all the same. That's true only to a certain extent. 
one of the most standardized and regulated situations of looking at things is the sightseeing bus. People are driven to places that are considered worth looking at, and they are told when and where to look at what. So we might assume that the photographs they take are on par with the accepted, expected standards. They are not. This snapshot was taken from a tour bus in the 1980s, most likely with an all automatic point and shoot camera. It's a fine example of voyeurism that is acceptable in modern society. And hardly anything about it is in accordance with established standards. The framing, the tilted camera, the reflection in the glass, the face in the lower right, and the seat cover at the lower left are totally accidental details. And these are not secondary features of the snapshot, but they constitute it. This is not only true for this particular snapshot, but for a substantial portion of all photographs ever made. For the person who snapped the picture, nothing was wrong with it. It was included in a travel album, just as the ones that match the standards. Discovering such a photograph in an anonymous album was a happenstance. And equally serendipitous is a look at the location where it was made. Roughly 30 years after the event, Google Street View presents a photo of the scene, including one of the tourist buses, nearly exactly at the location where the snapshot was made. Not only photographs are accidental, but also the context when and where they are being presented, and we look at them. Artists have been exploring and employing chance in various ways, both in the production and presentation of photographs. I'll present a few examples. Duncan Wooldridge made a set of five dies, each one devoted to one of the basic parameters of photography, exposure time, aperture, film speed, etc. Without using the dice, we understand that mathematically speaking, the chances to get it right are very slim. Someone might, however, base their choices on the throw of the dice, nevertheless, and learn quite a bit about photography. It is predictable that most results would be useless, but the few that are not might actually show us something we never saw before. From the 1960s on, conceptual artists explored the possibilities of chance systematically, mostly based on the idea of letting the camera do what the camera does best, without wanting to have control over the process. Ottmar Hörl, for example, used cameras that advance film automatically and make several exposures per second. Placing these devices in specifically designed experimental settings, the cameras would make random photos, for example, when being dropped from an airplane or from a tall building. It's art about cameras, and it's art about cameras. But things get more interesting when other factors come into play. In 1972, Franco Vaccari participated in the Biennale di Venezia with a very simple work that turned into a complex installation by inviting the audience to participate in the process. He placed a standard photo booth machine in the gallery. There was nothing at the walls other than a sentence asking visitors to leave a trace of their passage through the gallery. Step by step, the audience created the exhibition without any guidelines or instructions. Thus, a collective portrait emerged consisting of thousands of strips made in the exhibition space itself. Both the photographs and their arrangement were made by the audience without any intervention by the artist. He did nothing but create the conceptual frame, the audience did the rest. Chance can play a role in the production of photographs, in their presentation and in their reception. A work by Sarah Childsworth explores the latter. In her series, Modern History, 
She photographed at actual size the front pages of newspapers and blanked out everything except for the photographs and mastheads. We look at the selection of international papers published the same day. All of them include the same photograph, but each one places it in a different context. So photographs that were never meant to be seen together start interacting with each other, creating new associations. The photo taken of Italian politician Aldo Moro by his kidnappers was published by virtually every paper around the globe. And most of these papers had more than one photograph on the page. Depending on the reader's language, their location, and their preference for one paper or the other, people would see the very same picture in very different vicinities, which leads to a variety of possible associations. The modern equivalent of such a project would be a study of online resources. A search for Aldo Moro produces rather predictable results. But things look different if we search for the date when the photograph in question was published. 21 April 1978 produces similar results both in my standard German settings as in the English language version. And it's interesting to note that both of them include photos of Sarah Charlesworth, but not the original photograph her work is based on. Switching the language to Italian changes a lot. We tend to understand search results as a form of natural information. They are not. They are custom tailored by an algorithm that is constantly fed with information about our search history, our location, our shopping preferences, and much more. Two people searching simultaneously for the same thing with identical search terms most likely see very different results while assuming they talk about the same thing. In my own artwork, chance does play a role in all the ways I mentioned before, in the production and in the presentation of work. Sometimes I simply leave the door open for chance to sneak in. Sometimes I force it to happen. A few examples. In April 1986, the world witnessed an unprecedented catastrophe. Living in Berlin, we felt very close to it. It was the time of the Cold War. And then when thinking about the possible threat from the East, people imagined tanks and missiles. The actual threat, however, was completely invisible. In a helpless attempt to get a picture of something that is not photographable, I made some photos of the empty sky showing nothing while demonstrating how useless photography is in such a situation. That was the idea. Holding the camera out of the window, facing east, I pressed the button without looking through the viewfinder. At that time, I was experimenting with low-grade materials. For this purpose, I used a roll of black and white film made in Soviet Union. When processing the film, I, made, I worked sloppily, and as a result, I got these spots in the negatives. So by chance, my own little mistake made another bigger one visible. Together with a brief text, these prints form a work that turned out to be something it was never meant to become. In the early 1980s, I became interested in the idea of bad pictures. Photography was at that time on its way to an established art form and people were interested in good pictures. So I wondered which ones were not considered good. One, the, the, the 1000 prints I found in the streets in cities around the world during the following 30 years built a museum of photographic trash. It's a collection of unwanted pictures that are so bad or so disturbing that they were thrown out. Each one is proof that something went wrong in a person's life. 
I find them interesting both as visual artifacts and as documents of modern society. Such a collection is accidental by definition. I never knew when and where I would find what. In addition, the random traces left by weather and traffic add another layer of information to the, on the pictures themselves. In its presentation, chance is also the decisive factor of the project. Although the items are displayed strictly in chronological order of the finding, the series looks different in every exhibition. The selection is based on a simple mathematical formula depending on the existing space. Soon after the work was completed, a friend found a discarded library copy, oops, sorry, I made a mistake, uh, of a book for me. By accident, the rubber stamp was placed just at the right position before the book was taken out of the library. That is the theoretical foundation of the project actually discovered on eBay. A twin of this project is the series of prints based on found negatives. There's the same extra layer of information induced by deterioration. Then the, the negatives were picked up from the gutter. I printed them and show them as my own photographs, but I know absolutely nothing about them except when and where they were found. Everything else is imagination and your guess about them is as good as mine. This one is actually my, one of my favorite, all-time all favorite pictures. I found the negative in front of that one hour lab that is depicted in the background of the picture. So it's like a closed circle of right, producing a photograph, from, uh, looking at it, throwing it out it, it, all in one spot. For years, I had been gathering large amounts of photographs in the hope I could use them sooner or later for one project or the other. Eventually, I had to admit that the majority are actually not useful at all. However, I was not ready to abandon the idea of recycling. The solution was a shredder. The machine turned all the meaningful information into meaningless matter. By randomly reassembling the shreds one by one, a new meaning emerged. The final works are white noise. This started with film stills I originally intended to reuse for a photo novel. The raw material for other pieces were picture postcards or pinup photos, fashion catalogs, or other kinds of printed matter, basically every paper-based garbage information that modern society produces in huge quantities. Making these pieces was tedious manual labor, which is something I enjoy. The series ended with a complete Mar Marlboro billboard after which friends started to doubt my mental sanity. During the 1980s and 90s, I worked on a project called Archiv that was centered around the idea of identifying recurring patterns in popular photography. Many of the photographs used for this project were bought at flea markets, and that was one of the project's limitations. There's a limited number of photographs available at these markets, and most of them were made several decades ago. When online photo hosting became a popular thing, the situation changed dramatically. More images are uploaded every minute than I can ever look at. And now I had access to unlimited numbers of images and they were contemporary. For the first time, it was po possible to watch how new models and patterns emerge and spread. In, and we could watch that in real time. I was working on the assumption that with the incredible proliferation of photographic activity, new patterns would show up. Flickr was the largest online photo pool at that time, 
when I started working on the project. As a bonus, there was the page most recent uploads. This presented a random selection of photos uploaded the previous minute, and it became my main research tool. Of course, there is a search function in Flickr, but this was completely useless for my endeavor. I was interested in discovering what's there and not in searching for things I knew were there. But there's another reason. The search engine is simply useless if the data does not match the engine's logic. The search engine does not identify visual but textual information. Photographs that are not captioned, described, or tagged properly will never be found. And that's the mass majority of files on online hosting platforms. Most photographs are identified by nothing but the file number attributed by the camera. And that's pretty useless if you search for something specific. To make things worse, user-generated content is often faulty. If there's textual information, it is often of such poor quality that the search engine would never find it. It's hopeless if the leaning tower of Pisa is called Pizza Tower. And on the right, you have uh, an example for the entertainment of the local audience here. Chance encounter is the only way to get hold of pictures you don't know yet. While working on this project, I was longing for something, for something like a, a find engine instead of a search engine. The page, the page most recent uploads was the only thing available that came close to that. I reloaded this page hundreds of times a day. Whenever something caught my attention, I downloaded the photo. After some months, I had a picture pool of thousands of new photographs and started sorting and grouping them. There were the known patterns of popular photography, but also new ones like this one, for example. This, this is how the average first photograph taken with a new camera looks. Uh, or the ubiquitous selfie that we now find. Uh, I mean, this has become an established pattern, but we have to keep in mind that 20 years ago, nobody made such a photograph. We tend to forget these things. Uh, also, there were lots of short-lived short fashions of a specific community that were replaced by the next one soon, so I uh, neglected or ignored those. From hundreds of groups, I selected 96 and made a print-on-demand book with a series of photographs for each of them. As a group, these form an encyclopedia of modern popular photography. The selection of themes is neither systematic, nor does it follow any established criteria. The project's structure mirrors the multifaceted, contradictory, and chaotic practice of modern photography itself, as well as the accidental character of its making. So I'm showing you now a number of these books just to get, give you an idea about the scope of what they are. Uh, in detail, I could show you, uh, well, I think that would take another evening, but we don't do that uh, tonight. So this is like the re redefinition of documentary uh, photography in modern times. We forgot to take photographs during lunch today. Yeah, and that again. So this together forms that library of popular photography. And uh, I present these both as books, but also in exhibitions in very sober reading room type of installations. So like here, or this one is actually my favorite uh, installation so far because it was installed in a former monastery. And when working on the project, I actually had 
a reading room of a monastery always uh, less, I, like the ideal in front of me, how it should be presented. So that was a very uh, lucky coincidence. Um, not long after completing this work, Flickr got a redesign. The page most recent upload still exists, but it is now ruled by Flickr's algorithm called interestingness. As a result, the photographs you see on that page now look like very slick commercial rubbish and they are predictable as stock photography. My work would no longer be feasible after this redesign. Thank you for your attention. Good. You can ask questions, make comments to Joachim. You started with a trick, with a trick. You've compared the machine that was used by the monkey, the device, the David Slater camera that the monkey used for the selfie and compared it to the computer where in the zoo, the monkeys were trying to randomly or oh, were, were, were beating their fists on the keyboard. If the first ape managed to take a selfie, it's because he wasn't using a 19th century uh, camera. Had he been using a 19th century camera, it would have been impossible. What the ape did was to press a series of automatic algorithms that led to a result, a standard result in terms of exposure, framing, etc. The frame was random, but everything else was pre-established in the device, in the genetics of the device. But with a computer, with a word processor, it was not the case. Uh, the beginning of statistics, the uh, if you look at the law of averages or probability, if an infinite number of monkeys had randomly hit a keyboard, for, the serendipity would have led to Don Quixote or Romeo and Juliet. It's statistic, infinite number of monkeys, infinite. So it's not, it's not that chance affects photography more than text, but rather that in this case, it's a question of, well, two devices uh, with automatic devices that were different and with different tempos, with different tempos. But even so, it was fascinating. I have doubts about uh, this. Uh, the basic difference is that the word processor has not any built-in knowledge. You know, there's, there's not, it doesn't contain any prefabricated patterns for, for creating this type or that type of text, whereas the camera actually has a lot of knowledge incorporated. So the one is more an apparatus that allows you to create all kinds of texts if you know how to write, but the other one allows you to create all types of photographs without knowing to, to make our photograph. And I think that is a very big difference. So you can give millions of monkeys, millions of computers, they will never produce a good book or any book at all that's readable. I'm absolutely sure of that. Of course, they, they will produce a variety of output, uh, but hardly anything that is a, a readable sentence in any known language. I wanted to ask you, I wanted to make, oh, yeah. Oh. Entiendo que... I, if I'm not mistaken, when you find these pictures, they're pictures that uh, you don't know where they come from. They've come from you don't know where. And that's maybe what makes them better or worse. 
but it reminds me like when you go to villages and you see the castle that's been deconstructed and how those stones have been carried to other places and have nothing to do with the original castle. Photography as a unity of construction that has been sort of disassembled from its natural space and you give it a new meaning. But I also think that we could construct Romeo and Juliet by hearing or listening to loose words on the street. Maybe it would take years and years, but maybe we would be able to reconstruct Romeo and Juliet by hearing and picking up words on the street. What do you think? There, there are lot, lots of writers who appropriate language, uh, all types of languages, uh, vernacular uh, pieces. Uh, you can pr pr produce all kinds of, of interesting texts, but it requires uh, some uh, attention and knowledge. It's, it, it does not happen automatically. And I mean, sometimes it's only minimal interventions that, you know, that they, 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 there's poems that, that consist of nothing but a shopping list uh, found in the street or, 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 or the roster of a football team. But still, it's intentional decisions to, to uh, call that a poem and present that in a, in a, in a specific context. El otro día, leyendo un libro sobre... the, other, the other day, I was reading a book on evolution, which said that birds fly and they don't know that they fly. They're not aware that, 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 that they can fly. Do you agree uh, with the, in, 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 the, in the thought that the difference between photos and text is that in a text, you have to be competent to understand. You have to know a language and know how to read but in front of a picture, you can be competent without being educated. Or can you, can anybody, anybody can give significance or meaning to a picture, irrespective of whether that picture was thought uh, or was given that meaning or not. What do you think about that? Is that required? Uh, well, let's say an, a, a person with experience, knowledge and education will do that in a different way. But of course, everybody can stare or look at the picture and uh, have some kind of association. Uh, but your understanding and reading of uh, any one single picture or a group of pictures uh, is, of course, deeper and more complex if you looked at more and if you know more about it. Uh, that's quite obvious, isn't it? Thank you. Um, good. I, I, I've got a question. Um, yesterday, I was here in this room, uh, but uh, online. I saw the lecture online. And I asked a question online, which was, what, because the lecture had mentioned that we are going through different crises. And my question was, apart from the most obvious crises, the pandemic, climate change, what do you think, what other crises are we going to have to experience? That was my question. And I didn't want to, the speaker, the lecturer, did not answer my question, did not want to answer my question, or didn't answer my question. Now, I was thinking about some crises that we might experience. I've come up with three. I've come up with three. I'd like to know, and I think they have quite a lot to do with your work. The first one is a crisis of truth, a crisis of truth in these times of post-truth, populism, uh, and, and, and lies. There's a crisis of truth. There's a crisis of truth. Number two, we are in a crisis of physical presence. Uh, in other words, we are reducing the senses to the visual, purely visual aspects of life. Everything is being reduced to the visual. 
you have said that you like the work, man, manual work. This presence of the body in the work and this presence of your body in your work that you need, you like to interact with the material. And I, and I think that there's a, a, today or yesterday, I wasn't physically in the room and therefore I couldn't interact physically with a question and perhaps that was the reason why I didn't get an answer. So that is the, 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 the other crisis that we have. Things are being reduced to the visual. I often, uh, when I chat with my wife, I argue with her because we're not face to face. And the third crisis, and I think it has to do with your work, is the crisis of monotony, the crisis of monotony. Everything is becoming poorer today, even birds. I heard the other day that in 25 years, 25 years ago, or in the last 25 years, the number of birds has dropped dramatically, and therefore the amount of bird song that we hear is much less than it used to be. And this affects us human beings because we like bird song. It's relaxing, but there are less and less birds and there's less bird song. These are three of the crises that I myself uh, can imagine. I would like to know whether those three crises, monotony, lack of physical presence in your new work, where you just work on the internet, online, you don't get involved physically, you don't pick things up from the gutter, and the crisis of truth. Does this make any sense to you? Uh, it, it clearly does make sense, and probably there's, there's a few more. Uh, I would not be able to uh, tell you now everything I talk uh, without uh, thinking about it. Uh, and I mean, you know, ask, you asked, what are we going to face? Uh, my capacity as a as an oracle is not very developed. Uh, if you want to know about the future, to talk to a fortune teller. But yeah, yeah. But no, I, I, if they, it definitely might, does make sense, and I, I I agree with with what you said. Uh, Probably it, it does not uh, affect everybody the, the, the same way because it depends on individual context of how, how we spend our time and how we how we work and how we how, how we live. But uh, it's it, it's 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 definitely things that uh, play a decisive role in modern life. Yeah. And the reduction to not just not the reduction not to take yeah. photographs from the floor to move your body but to only do it by a mouse click. No, that must have changed a lot. I guess that's my real question. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, you know, Andres mentioned in the beginning that I um, moved out of the city not long ago and I'm, uh, I'm a, a country dweller now. So uh, chopping fire, which is something like very a satisfying activity, I can tell you. And no, I'm serious about that. It's, Joachim said to me yesterday that in his own work process, the factor that benefits him, the fact that there are many, many images, that is something that happens in his own studio. He collects pictures, images for some project, some specific project, and then he gets rid of them. He he. He generates rubbish too. He generates rubbish. And I would like to ask him, after all these years that you've been working with pictures, with archives, you've been interacting with all this material in your own work, and you've been generating residues, rubbish, what do you do with the archives, with all that huge amount of material? With the immense, the huge amount of material, now that you've moved after decades of working with these processes your relationship is different uh, with that material and living surrounded by that huge amount of material um, that's an interesting question and i would um i would like to start 
with some remarks about the word to collect. Um, my, my native language is German and in German, we only have one word, sammeln, that covers all types of collections. But in English, there's actually two words that are talking about very different types of collections. So when we talk about collections, you know, there's like natural history collections, there's art collections, there's stamp collections, there's coin collections and so on. But in the, if, if you look at it anthropological terms, uh, what again in German is called Jäger und Sammler, hunter and gatherer, it's not hunter and collector, it's hunter and gatherer. And the person who gathers something does not collect to study or to accumulate or to impress, but for the own consumption. And I see myself as an artist in, in that tradition. I'm, I'm gathering materials that I use in my work. I consume them. And when I'm done with it, the leftovers are trash. I don't see any specific value in it. I, I, I gather these things, I look at them, I process them, I select what I need. It's, you know, it's like peeling potatoes. You need to take the part you want and the, the peel goes out. And this, this, this is how, how it works. And I think it's a very liberating process of throwing out the leftovers. You know, like when I start working on a project, I, I gather stuff. And then when the project is done, it goes out into the world, it's being shown, it's being presented, it's being sold, whatever. And the leftovers go in a trash bin. And uh, that's a very liberating process. And I'm very happy not to be surrounded by stuff that I don't need anymore. Sometimes I have regrets about throwing out too much, but that's how it goes. At the beginning of your career, to discover the value of this domestic photography that nobody had paid much attention to, aesthetically at least, you understood it and you compared it to the arrogance of artistic photography produced for the museums and the art galleries. But now some museums are exhibiting what they call vernacular domestic photography, popular photography, uh, police photography, forensic po uh, photography. And that now is becoming something that is exhibited in museums too. So what do you think of that? What would be the new territory now that nobody's paying attention to? What territory should we look at now? Uh, that's a hard one. I mean, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not going to develop uh, the exhibition policy for all museums in the world. Um, it, it, but it is true, of course, that the, the, the scope of things that are, that curators pay attention to nowadays has uh, increased dramatically. We, uh, and I, I can't think of, of anything right away that is not potentially uh, being presented in, in, in an exhibition. There, there's hardly any, any taboo, hardly anything that uh, nobody would ever touch. Uh, so uh, if, if I have general ideas about uh, the exhibition policies of, of places, it's, it's, it's rather that there's a lot of stuff that I would prefer not to see, but that's not for me to decide. That's personal preferences and not a general advice. But uh, I can't think of anything that is totally left over, uh, left left out. I mean, do do you? Is, is there anything you think that's so important to look at that nobody looks at? Creo que es muy interesante. Tenemos ahora... I think it's very interesting. We have a panoramic. Uh, we have two artists that work with uh, leftover materials: Dinick Elberman and Jonathan Brown. Dinick Elberman works with no aesthetic criteria using Google as a index for images, no filters, 
no prejudice. And Jonathan Brown works the opposite way. He is an artisan. He looks for pictures that are singular, that are unique. And uh, perhaps Elberman's criteria is to not apply any criteria at all to what he's searching for. It's practically automatic, the process. And uh, that perhaps shows us two examples of territories that we have perhaps forgotten about today. But uh, it's already been discovered by these artists who are, in a way, mediators. In the world of outsi uh, outsider art, I'm thinking of Miroslav Tiji in photography, there are always mediators, collectors, curators, photographers, artists, Mm, and you have to have an educated eye in order to discover something that other people have overlooked. In the world of outsider art, that is quite controversial, and it's very interesting to look at art brut, art made by people with no academic training, people that are living on the limit of, of their mental health, but always in there is always somebody some mediator educated mediator in the world of outsider art there's a controversy about that mediation we through artists like you in the in recent decades have learned to appreciate how interesting these other territories are and the subjective random way in which we have reconsidered all this there are so many points of view uh, that I can use when I use images in communication with other people and share with other people. There is, I don't think there is that controversy here. Your role as artists um, regarding these images doesn't include uh, that controversial idea in the world of outsider art that says that in order to appreciate images uh, from the outside of society, you need educated mediators. When you began at the beginning of the 80s to find all this material and to search for all this material, were you thinking about any artists, any collections, any pioneers, Dados, other collectors that were beginning to do their work at the beginning of the 80s and publish books on domestic photography that were very interesting because they were funnily made bad photographs. Uh, did you have any names, any referen reference points, any, any either professional or non-professional people, people that you'd studied with? Did you have a community? Was there any kind of community around you? Uh, or maybe not. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, when I started working with photography, I I did I, I did not study photography like in the in in an established program, but I I, I studied at a graphic design department and uh, basically everything I learned about photography was self-taught. Uh, so there was uh, a library at the art school with uh, a number of photography books, but uh, don't confuse that with what we have today. You know, like something like the standard reading where, where those time, time life volumes uh, that uh, one was called color and the other was, was called sport photography, or whatever they were called, I mean, it was extremely poor situation in, in photographic literature and uh, the only thing that was kind of intelligent and uh, what, what were the the essays by Susan Sontag and they they were published in, in, in German basically the the moment when I started becoming interested in photography and it was one of the first books about photography I read and it basically it set for me something like the gold standard about thinking about photography um, I, I did not have a, a, a group of like-minded people around me. I was just like doing my own research or whatever you want to call it in, 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 in a rather naive way. Um, and um, I, I started uh, 
basically, I, 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 got, I got suspicious of my own photographic activity pretty soon for good reasons. And I don't have any regrets about not continuing that way I went there. And instead of um, taking or making my own photographs, I uh, concentrated on writing uh, about photography. And uh, this was so, soon the beginning of my own magazine because uh, there was just so many things I was interested in that nobody would want to publish because the few magazines that existed at that time were mostly busy with the uh, massive effort to establish photography as an art form. You know, we are also artists. And uh, for them, it was crucial to exclude everything else. That's not photography, you know. This is this, what we do is photography, but everything else is just rubbish and we shouldn't pay any attention to that. And we should have a clear wall between this and that. And, uh, and I had completely different perspective because what I liked about photography is that a, a photograph is, is never a, a, a fixed thing. Uh, it, 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 it does not have a fixed meaning depending on the, re, on the respective context. It works in quite different ways, but the very same picture can show up in different contexts and fulfill different functions and be interpreted in different ways. And uh, so uh, I worked along on my own and the longer I did that, the more my interest shifted from writing again to uh, incorporating visuals into the work and eventually the, uh, it, the, the writing ceased and uh, the visuals uh, took over. One of the things that Susan Sontag says, very interesting, is that photography images on their own are uh, leave a lot of room for speculation in your photographs of the berlin sky after chernobyl chernobyl you were probably looking for that kind of thing in one of your works your projects and harum faraki used to say the footprint is everything the context that allows us to access a picture conditions the way in which we see that image one of your masterworks of photography you reassigned a series of found photographs to masters of photography, Mansell Adams, Walker Evans, other names. And people, people thought that those pictures had to do with those. Could you tell us about that? That's a work made in 1988, 1989 and published at that time, there was like people were celebrating 150 years of photography. It was a very important thing. Uh, te te technology published in 1839, so 150 years later, there were lots of exhibitions here and there, and, and they all more or less were the same, focusing on the best photography has produced over the past 150 years. <laughs> and I wanted to make a, a comment about that uh, because working with found snapshots. I had noticed that quite often in, let's say, in, in a group of a thousand photographs that somebody makes, there's the one, there's one or two outstanding ones that more or less accidentally resemble something that looks like could have been made by. And together with a friend uh, who had a similar observation, we went through our collections and we uh, selected 20 of them and attributed them to the respective photographers in a way that they would match their oeuvre. So they got proper titles as the photographer would have called them, dated to match uh, the oeuvre. And then we published them as a limited edition portfolio of what we called original reproductions. And I don't know how, ma how many uh, people who acquired the portfolio ignored the, the, the fact that, that they were called reproductions, and, uh, but I mean, I, I, I think most of the uh, collectors appreciate the comment uh, about uh, that attitude towards uh, established photography, uh, but there were a number of uh, very funny reactions uh, and we were quite careful in including works by living photographer 
but surprisingly one of the dead ones reacted uh, in a very strange way. So there was a nice photograph of a woman at the beach, uh, at a double exposure that was attributed to René Magritte because it really looked very much like one of his photographs. And we used it for, for advertising the, the series. And soon after the thing was published, we received a letter by uh, a, a law firm from Geneva that, well, we represent the estate of René Magritte and we noticed that you published one of Magritte's photographs and uh, you did not ask for permission and you did not pay the appropriate fee for reproducing that and we ask for your uh, statement and how can we settle these things and I mean it was friendly but very specific uh, and so I thought about that for half a day and then I answered uh, that I'm a young artist and I would like to avoid any trouble and of course I'm willing to pay whatever they ask for and just please don't sue us and uh, just send us the invoice but unfortunately there's a little doubt whether this is really a Magritte photograph. So could you please certify that? It's definitely a Magritte. And after that, we go to the financial department. And so they, they employed an art historian for, I don't know, half a year. And that person was like looking at everything and eventually they wrote again, well, this is definitely not a Magritte. And said, well, thank you very much. <laughs> If we think about what has just been said, but also the previous question about how you felt when museums and institutions today begin to accept everything and photography, vernacular, popular, lumpen photography uh, as, a, as classic material, I would propose as a hypothesis of what is happening in the decade of the 80s, I think that photography went into a crisis. More than a crisis, the history of photography went into a crisis. You have mentioned 1989, how the commemoration of the 150 years of history of photography all the books that came out the tributes the events the exhibitions um uh, there was a kind of euphoria of celebration but nobody realized that things were happening digital photography was born that was going to revolutionize the the ontological uh, uh, situation of photography thomas and David Ternol invented Photoshop that was going to shake up mm, journalism, everything. So there were things happening that were very, very important, but there was a need to rethink and to review the past of photography, as if suddenly those interpretations, Erda, Gershin, all these others, had been visions that were absolutely narrow, Eurocentric, uh, pa patriarchal, colonialistic, and all the rest of it. And many alternatives emerged, began to emerge, new ways of looking at photography and criticizing photography, uh, the photography of the past. In the 80s, work like your work and other other people's work that uh, uh, look at the past with a look of irony and also postmodernism, which led to remakes to pastiche to redoing ironically redoing masterpieces of the past changing faces in pictures from men to women and things like that but there was also a marginal trend which was the emergence of a new form of devotion for uh, advertising police photography forensic pho photography domestic photography photography that had not been important and that emerged as a movement at that time although there had been some precedents but 
That is a way of explaining perhaps why, as from the 1980s, there is a convergence of all these different dynamics that look back to reconsider the past and move forward into a much more open and much more rich photography. But uh, there's also a question of precedence. When I look at your work, one of the engines of the work is to look for paradoxes. You're looking for things that are unusual. You are looking for anomalies, magical anomalies, where most people just see rubbish. And that, to me, is like having a privileged eye that has enriched us all. But when we think about precedents, there is a precedent, Hans Peter Feldman. Hans Peter or Peter Feldman. How do you feel about him? What, what are, in what way do you feel that you share things with him? And in what way do you think you're different from him? He is, he is perhaps uh, different in the, in the way he approaches, in his sense of humor, in the way he looks for shocking results or surprising results in images. What would you say? How do you uh, compare yourself to Feldman? Once now, uh, I mean, let me uh, co comment on a few things. I mean, it's, it is true that uh, in the 1980s, the, the work I did was very much marginalist as, as other alternative approaches too. And uh, that has uh, changed in the course of time. And uh, yes, the, it, it was a, uh, a period of something new was, it was, was emerging and uh, the uh, let's let's call it uh, photographic establishment was trying to preserve the status quo that they were, had just been fighting for now being uh, acknowledged as an additional art form so uh, everything else was uh, looked at rather well now they want to mix up our game again and we should just fix the rules and and they they, they want to change the rules uh Speaking of Feldman, of course, he, he uh, is like, like uh, in many respects uh, a forerunner of um, what, what, what I did. Uh, I, I knew uh, not a lot, but some of his work, um, in particular, the, uh, the little books that I, I, I like a lot. I think they are, they're absolutely fantastic. The builder with an, uh, any number that, that would uh, be the respective number of, 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 of pictures in, in, in the little booklets. Um, other works uh, I'm not very fond of, uh, but uh, that's more or less personal preferences. Um, the, 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 main, the main difference and, and probably the, uh, the key for, for Feldman's success was that he, uh, imme that, that he never, um, collaborated with the photography world. He placed himself always in the context of contemporary art, so he would never show at the, photo at the photography museum or at the photo gallery, even if its work was photographic. So basically he sneaked uh, in through the, through the back door into the, into the art museum, and he was uh, pretty much ac accepted uh, through the uh, with with the help of of the few curators that supported his work, and that was a very clever uh, move. I think uh, I was more stupid in that respect. Uh, and bueno, os agradezco. Good. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much to you, Joachim, to uh, the audience, everybody who's followed online. Thank you, Joachim, for being here this evening. Thank you to everyone. Wait, wait a minute. Let me add one sentence. Thank you to the translator who's doing a good job. Thank you.